I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my line unless it's money on the phone. I think the first attribute that's most important that's required is having a great ear, being a fantastic listener. Um, that's the first. If you don't listen to what people are saying, you're just ready to get the next word out. You're never going to be a great facilitator. Um, the second thing is, I think, is having extreme patience um, because sometimes people um, will do things from their own POV that they think is right or that they think they're being done wrong. And you may not feel that way, but you have to be patient enough to hear them all the way out and then patient enough to come to them with a solution that's gonna help everyone, if that makes sense. And then the, the last thing I would say is, you kinda have to kill your ego. You kinda have to, I remember Rumi said, you have to give up the drop to become the ocean. So you have mm -hmm. to be very, very giving. You have mm -hmm. to give pieces of yourself to others because you may be able to, you may be like, you know what? I don't need none of this, I'm already good. But you know, if I don't do this, the team's not good. Mm -hmm. So you gotta give up yourself to become a whole. Mm. And that's 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 really, really powerful and impactful. And I think those three things are very, very important because one listening, a lot of people, we think we're great, great listeners. But like you said, a lot of times we're listening just to respond and to react. We're not listening to understand. So I think that's very, very powerful, like just just coming into situations and really figuring out what someone is saying and uh being in a position I used to be in sales, I think that's very powerful because a lot of people, whenever you're selling something, you're not listening to what that person's need is. You're just trying to figure out how you can get them to buy this. But if you're coming from, you, it sounds like you're coming from a place of value giving and really just trying to understand and just really trying to give them the most beneficial answer, the most beneficial direction. A thousand percent. That's it to a T. So, Anthony, I kind of want to go into the general manager position more. Like, I know you said you do a lot of connecting people, but like, could you explain a little bit more about exactly what a general manager is and what they do? So with the basketball team, um, I'm the assistant general manager and the head of basketball operations. Mm -hmm. So all the basketball operations pertaining to the entire team, like our practice schedule, when guys are traveling, flights, meetings, um, if we're looking at new venues, et cetera, um, how can we can increase ticket sales? I wear many, many hats, um, no pun intended. Um, and then on, on the on the baseball side of things and also on the general manager side of things on the basketball side, I have a program called the lab, which means life after basketball that mm -hmm. I created for my players to give them that great opportunity to learn, to transition into being entrepreneurs or not just entrepreneurs, whatever you want to do in life after basketball. So we can start thinking about it now. You may want to be a recording artist. You may want to be um, a carpenter. We don't know what you want to be, but let's tap into that now. So when it's time to put the basketball down, you're not as scared. You have like a head start. So the lab, mm -hmm. Life After Basketball, was created last year to kind of give these guys a trampoline that they can jump off of. Um, so that's kind of like encompasses everything else that I do as a GM. And also the biggest thing is always trying to find ways to add value to everyone around me. That's the biggest thing a GM got to do because people look for you for leadership, People look to you for like that final word and your final word can't be biased. Some things that I say um, that I want to say, I won't say because it may seem biased. Mm. You, have to, you, have, you have to make the decision that's not always your decision, but a decision for the whole team or for the full, whole organization. Because the way you think now may be too fast for everyone else. Sometimes you got to slow your process down and get everyone to that lane and then we can move together as a unit because you don't want to get people left behind. It's kind of like a, a fast relay team when the... When the um, the first three guys are really, really fast, but the anchor is slow. You're not going to have a good relay team because you're going to get a lead, and then at the end, you're going to lose the race. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have a team with balanced speed, and that's why I try to create this balance. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's the basis of everything. And then on the baseball side, it's um, the HPP program, high performance. Um, baseball is a little different sport where the players aren't as, I would say, needy. Um, the players are kind of more laid back and reclusive where um, they work out, they know their schedule, they know their regimen. I just got to make sure they're doing the right things on and off the field. Um, baseball, like they go on the field and they go back into the dugout. So it's the culture of baseball is different than basketball. So everything's a lot more laid back. So that was a lot more, I won't say easier, but it's easier to connect with guys because you can sit down and talk with them for longer periods of time. Mm. Mm. I, I love that the lab program, bro. I really do because I think that's, that's so important. Like you, like we, we touched on your journey, like transitioning from it, but like even just from a money management standpoint or anything where it comes to like giving these players and people assistance because 
in our community, a lot of times we don't learn about this type of stuff. Like, like we would, we've been given this, this belief system that it's like, Oh, sports is the way to make it. And like, once I make it to sports and, or once I make it to that highest level playing professionally, I'm good forever. But right. that's not realistically the case. Like they, there's a lot of education that has to come behind and like really prepare you for that life after, because whenever you, you playing and you may, you may have this hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar checks coming in. You can't be spending like that forever. Like you, you gotta make sure you preparing for, like you said, that life after. Hundred percent, and that's the biggest thing because they don't teach you that in school. They mm-hmm. don't teach you financial literacy. They teach you algebra. They teach you parabolas. They don't teach you these things that you're gonna really, really need to um, become successful. And or sorry, not just to become successful is when you become wealthy or you you run into some money. How are you gonna manage that money? If mm-hmm. if all I know is algebra or parabolas or what the prerequisite is, how, how are you gonna manage your money? How are you gonna I manage? I don't remember half that shit to be honest. How are you, how are you supposed to remember that? You're not gonna know. A- you're not gonna know bed mass, like that doesn't mean nothing. That's just ways to like make sure your brain's functioning. That's the functionality of your brain. That's like the cerebral cortex of your brain. That has nothing to do with decision making when you have a multi-million dollar company or you're a multi-million dollar brand and everyone around you says they have a have an opportunity to like start a company here or start something and you're giving everyone money. Mm. You have to learn to balance your money. Mm. And how are you, what's, what's some ways you're doing that with lab? You're getting these guys to understand, you know, managing your money is very important. Well, that's a great question. The, the, the main, the main focus of the lab, like the, the, the skeleton, or I would say the backbone of the land is financial literacy and financial independence. Mm-hmm. So I, I've partnered with a bank, a local bank here. Um, and we do the first thing, like the walk in the door of the lab, the prerequisite to move forward is you got to go through this financial literacy course with us. You got to, and they, and they teach, they teach all the players about credit. They teach them about mortgages. They teach them about how you can make your money work for yourself, investing, what's the right way to invest, um, different ways that they can find find financial freedom um, with investing and, and things like that in stocks. And we go through the whole, we break it down for like, I think maybe two, three weeks when we start and then we move from there. Hey, that's beautiful. And I, I kind of have another question, man. You're doing all of these things. You're such a go-giver. How do you stay charged to where you can keep on pouring into other people? I think that's something that's highly overlooked mm-hmm. and highly effective people and people who are kind of leading people. They don't realize that the leader has times where they don't want to lead or you might need somebody to lean on also. How do you stay as I guess like as tip top in shape for everyone else who needs you? That's a great question. Um, three things I do a lot. I meditate a lot. That's one. Um, I read a lot. I'm an avid reader. Reading is like my, my, my best thing I love to do. I read 60 books a year. And the third thing I, the third thing I do is um, I pay attention to my, to my energy. Mm-hmm. I try to keep people mm-hmm. around me that have great energy. When I feel someone's like an energy vampire, I'll pull away from them. Like, mm-hmm. I don't just be around people to be around people because I think you can get drained that way. I like people that charge my battery too. I like that. that, that yeah, that's yeah. that's important because that that last one, there's definitely people that sometimes you don't realize, but every time they come around, something fucked up happens or oh, wait. It's, some, it's some <laughs> they, they ruin your energy, yeah. man. Like, right away, right away. I like you, you ex- you excited and they don't even seem excited and then they yeah. just kind of bring you down and you now now look, you overlooking your accomplishment and shit is is you I'm telling be- you here's the biggest thing I want people to realize always pay attention to the people that say must be nice. Mm-hmm. You oh, tell them I just did this, oh must be nice. Pay attention to that person. Mm-hmm. Know where their mind is at right there. They may laugh it off, but there's a truth in every joke. The mm-hmm. must be nice people be the ones in the background taking your energy. They're not really happy for you. Because if you come to me and you tell me your accomplishment, I'm cheering harder for you than myself. I'm so happy that you did that. I'm I'm going crazy. Hit me with the must be nice. Okay, I know where your energy at. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Hey. Mm-hmm. Y'all. And I, I don't want to pass over the second. Yeah, then read. Too, I, do, yeah. I did want to I, talk like, about that. That's that's such a major one, too. Like read readers are truly leaders, bro. Like I genuinely believe that. Like I, I saw some a tweet I put out a long time ago. It was basically like something that my teacher told me in high school, she was like, when you read, you're dangerous. And it's <laughs> because like, they always say it's an old saying, if you want to hide information from a black person, you put it in a book. There like, we go. Like, if you 
take the time out your day to really just absorb information that can better you or like just help you in some way, shape or form, you you going to see so many more benefits from it. It is crazy to me that people think like that reading is such a hassle, especially now whenever there's so many different mediums you can absorb this content through. You can watch uh, videos. You can do audio audible. books. Uh, yep. It's, it's all kind of stuff, man. Like you can just really absorb this in the, there's the fucking books on your phone or you can do everything. everything. And I kind of want to ask you what, what would be your top five books? Is there like a certain book, any type of books? Yeah. That like I got to read this every year or every other year. What's your top five list of books? Top five list of books. First off, I think my favorite author is Robin Sharma. Um, mm. He's phenomenal. So my top five books, number one, fav- number one, I got the autobiography of Malcolm X, Alex Haley. Hey, I, right. I just love read that, that book, book, bro. You just read that? I read every, you got you to read it every year. Bro. <laughs> that book will change your perspective on some if shit. If you are change your perspective. Person, I say you you required to read that book. Hey, required. Hey, I'm, I'm about to call you out of the pod, bro. <laughs> I already know what you're going to do. Yes. Come on, chastise look, me. Come on, do it, do it. Shit. I read that book. Man, it was like, man, baby, you on some radical stuff, man. You tripping, bro. What's, what's wrong with you? Then he going to read the book. He coming to me talking the same way. I'm like, I told you, man. <laughs> no, don't worry, man. Like, everyone has their time, and it's not your fault. It's the narrative. The narrative pushed out there that it is some radical stuff. Mm. So when you see Malcolm, images of Malcolm X, they show, they show not the image with, with the rifle be out the window. They don't show them the images of him in Mecca. They don't show the images of him mm. praying a lot. They don't show that side of it. They want to show of him, show the images of him when he was young and doing things that people thought was inciting violence. That's how they do you. Mm. Man, it, yo, like like he said, yeah, I ain't gonna lie, I fucked up. I was judging him, but <laughs> it's a great book. Like, oh man, if you're a black person, I say that's a required reading. But even if you just any any a human being. You can gain so much from that book just because the dynamics of it and you really just get to understand on a deeper level. I really just felt like I got to connect with human life in a different way because the the, the way he explains some things, like you oh, said, man. on his trip to Mecca, like he understood, like and he, he realized that, you know, I was going around. I was going about attacking the information the incorrect way. And I also think one of the most powerful things from that book was. He was saying us as black people, especially in America, we're looking at this at too much of a one dimensional country. This is a country issue. It's not. This is a human rights human. issue. Yes. And once we yes. start to look at this as a global international issue, that's where we'll be able to start making some differences. We're able to start making some changes because you're violating human rights now. This right. is bigger than just, oh, change a bill here or something like that. No, there needs to be some actions and implications that go behind this. And you can't treat humans that way. A hundred percent. A thousand percent. And, and that book is everything for me. I read it once a year. So that's hey, like man. my I still want to hear the rest three. of the <laughs> list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I got um, Autobiography of Malcolm X, Alex Haley, number one, number two. I got The Alchemist. Mm. The Alchemist, that book was life-changing. Paulo Coelho, another phenomenal author. Um, At number two, number three, I got um, How to Lead Without a Title, Robin Sharma. That is um, a phenomenal read right there. Number four, I would possibly say the, I think it's The Monk. That sold his Ferrari. I heard Robin Sharma again. Yeah, Robin Sharma again. Those, 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 those two back to back. They're very similar in kind of those three. The Alchemist, um, leave out a title, and the Monk that sold his Ferrari are very, very similar in terms of how they're they're written in terms of the the, the message behind them. Mm-hmm. And then I would say number five, the Bobby Brown, Every Little Step, the autobiography of Bobby Brown, Every Little mm-hmm. Step. We we'll have to check that out. Check that one out. I was, a, I was a big Bobby Brown fan growing up. Um, and I read a plethora of books, so it's not like I'm just saying it, but Bobby Brown's story is something special. Mm. So Bobby Brown still be breathing right now. And for, I mean, I'm a little bit older. So going back in the day, Bobby Brown was Chris Brown before Chris Brown. So for Bobby Brown to still be standing right now, what he's gone through is, is amazing. The testament to that guy's life is just different level. You get to connect with human life when you read his book. Mm. Like the vulnerability in that book is... It's just pure. 
So I get to connect with that. And that's pretty much, that's my top five right now. Hey, I'm going to uh, definitely, definitely check those out. I heard the Alchemist was pretty good too. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's like one of those base, it's one of those underlying readings that you kind of like have to start with. Like kind of the, the, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Like it's like a requirement. Like to get on, a, on this type of wave or frequency, you got to see someone that had this amount of a level of discipline and um, an ability to make things change with his words and standing mm. behind his words, regardless mm. of the circumstances, knowing my, I'm going to give my life to this. Like, this is a different level. 